Hi, for the Love Book Club people. It is week four. Here we are. Last week. I know. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to Cheers you guys. Cheers to you. We love you. We have had uh, pretty much the most fun ever looking through your pictures, um, looking through your posts. I just retweeted one group who was having dinner oh. before the webcast and had the cutest picture of all of them sitting around the dinner table. And, of course, as you know, we love that. We love that, yes. And so this has been great. I hope that you guys continue book club. I mean, that's a good idea right there. Totally. Keep I mean, meeting. Um, we've barely even gotten to touch down on the billions of things we actually wanted to talk about. So um, you've got enough material in your hands to probably last for, what, another a couple years? Yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Keep anyway, meeting. So glad you're joining us. So glad you're with us. Um, super happy to talk about this last bit of the book. I mean... This is sort of where we're landing the plane, and I was just telling Jamie, um, this is probably a little bit more of the most serious part of the book, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. as we sort of talk about how to engage the world with integrity and with honor, um, and how to engage our communities, and so we've got just a lot of good stuff to talk about tonight, yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you. Okay. When you wrote, because you just said, this is what we talked about before, this is kind of the heavier part of the book. When you wrote For the Love, did you think, I kind of want to end on this? Like, I kind of want to end with church people? Mm -hmm. um, well, I was thinking of it in, like, concentric rings. And so I was thinking, let's, I'm going to deal with my own heart first, my own spiritual walk, and then let's talk about our families, the people who live in our house. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to talk about the people we mostly do life with, our church, our immediate community, and then end it as we sort of engage the world at large and our communities at large, and that is sometimes, at least in the Christian community, where the rubber leaves the road. Like, it's where we get the most awkward, it's where we get the most weird, um, it's where we get the most um, icky, mm -hmm. do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, we tend to do better in-house, and so I think that's probably why the substance here in this last bit kind of it kind of dug in. And for anyone who's like been around me for any amount of time, you know this is my wheelhouse yeah. anyway. Yeah. So I very much care about this. But also I'd like to recognize that we're both um, representing Austin tonight. Uh, we laugh because people who live in Austin like to wear Austin upon their bodies. Uh -huh. And we think it's like the best place in the earth, in the world. I, it's like almost, is this even a question? <laughs> right. Um, and so how many Austin t-shirts do you have? All of, every, I mean, just everywhere. All of them. Yeah. All Austin of the t-shirts. limits. Yes, yes. So mine is right now. Austin Angels, my good friend Susan and her beautiful, amazing nonprofit in our city. And so, yeah, I mean, all Austin all the time. Okay. Music nonprofits, love it. Um, so, yeah, like you said, people that know you, this is your wheelhouse. Yes. And so, I think, uh, you told me that a lot of people resonate with the Supper Club chapter. Totally. And about your kids. But I would guess that these chapters actually, like, people read them and they just kind of like hit them in their hearts. I, I hope so. And yeah. that's what I'm hearing, um, that some of this material is a little bit more difficult to wrestle through. Mm -hmm. um, and, and honestly, just more complicated. Mm -hmm. It's um, I think what we want typically when we encounter the world is this super clear path with very like this is the way to do it and these are the steps that we, and that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. That's just not the way we engage yeah. the world. And so to me, this is a little bit clunkier. Mm -hmm and more complex and more nuanced, which just makes it harder to talk about. You know what? We're going to give it a good old-fashioned yeah. try yeah. tonight. Okay, so we have lots of questions from you guys. Still use the hashtag FTL Book Club because you're going to keep doing this. Some of you don't watch it live, and we still want to hear your questions. Yep. So still use those hashtags. We'll pull some tonight as well. Jim, we're going to start with this one. Yes. It's a little, this has been a hard week. Um, yes, Buffy has. from Columbia, South Carolina says this. Jen, will you please pray for South Carolina? It's just a mess. So many have lost so much. Pray for them and for all of us who want help. Pray for us mamas who are home with kids going nuts um, and real stinky from no water. And pray that our kids will see the heart of Christ and the way that we respond to this tragedy. Thank you so much for this. Have you looked at some of the footage? Yeah. It's devastating. Mm -hmm. um, this has just been a hard week. Just a super hard week. I mean, I'm thinking about Oregon mm -hmm. still and that campus that is still just really yeah. in the community at large and and then South Carolina just underwater. And I just want you to know that um, so certainly here in Austin, but honestly all around the country and even the world, we are just so deeply praying for you in these affected cities and um, knowing that 
tragedy lasts there much longer than it's in the headlines. Right. We know how this goes. I mean, it's mm -hmm. today's news, but tomorrow it's going to be Miley Cyrus, yeah. and you're still going to be digging out of that water. You're still in water. Yeah. Um, you're still going to be digging out of that tragedy mm -hmm. in Oregon. And so I just I want you to know that we're committed um, to praying for you through the for the long haul. Yeah. Um, and thinking specifically of all you mamas mm -hmm. out there who are just um, facing circumstances you do, could not possibly prepare for, mm -hmm. um, or there's just there's not a handbook through things like this. Mm -hmm. um, we know that you're strong, and we know that you're capable, and we know that you can see your families and your community through. But you can count on us yeah. to really and sincerely hold you up in prayer, um, not just today and this week, but for all the weeks yeah. to come. Especially us moms in Austin, because we had something like this happen in yes, May. We, we had a big flood. So yes, we did. people here in our city, especially in the southern parts, close to you, yep. walk through this. We and are still walking through it. That's the thing. It That's doesn't thing. end when the news ends. Right. So, yeah, all of you guys. So for you. Okay, let's go on. Um, poverty tourism. Let's yes. just tackle that for a second. Huge response to that Okay, chapter. Kara from College Station right down the road from us, she said this. We're trying to find some great family-friendly mission projects that we can do at home with our small children to teach them the importance of serving others. What are some mission projects that you would recommend for families with little ones? I love this question, first of all. I think a lot of times when it comes to serving our cities, we leave that to the adults. And we just imagine that children are incapable or they're too little or they won't take it all in. And I think that is a fatal flaw. So I, don't, I hope none of us are content to leave our children with the felt Boards. Do you know what that is? Yeah, from that? Sunday Did you school. Grow up with that? Okay, like right. The Mary and the Joseph and the, the baby donkey. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like our kids can handle way more than we think they can. I'm here to tell you, even your littles, your littles are smart. There is a reason that Jesus said the kingdom belongs to little children. Um, so let's give it to them. Let's let's invite them in. There's a lot of things you can do from home, um, from the safety of your home. We've done um, all sorts of things. I can think of dozens of times that we collected toiletries, mm -hmm. and we lined them up sort of in an assembly line, um, the socks, mm -hmm. the water, the granola bars, um, the soap. Um, and you made bags? And we made bags. For we made baggies, uh -huh. Uh -huh. like in the big gallon ziplock, and we lined up the kids. The kids did all of it. You're in charge of socks. You're in charge of shampoo. You're in charge of toothbrush mm -hmm. and toothpaste. And they would assembly line it all down, and we would make hundreds of baggies, and then collectively as a um, restore group, it was just our small group, this could be whatever, it could be your friends, um, we would put dozens of bags in each of our cars and have them at all times so that um, we have a really large homeless population in Austin, and as we would drive around, we'd have those ready to hand out, um, and kids love that, but I would also say, now, I realize that this goes along with my parenting sensibilities, but don't underestimate what your kids can actually do on the ground. Um, not everything has to be pulled away um, sort of under your own roof. We bring our kids downtown. We bring our kids all the time. Well, I was going to say, tell us about, because I know when y'all go and do cookouts yeah. downtown, that might be scary for some moms because of the people that are coming through the line may look different for them, and yeah. they might be scared. Mm -hmm. How have you handled that with your little ones? Yes. Because you um, had little ones when y'all did that. Totally, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. And our church brings babies and toddlers. Mm -hmm. um, and so one thing that I would tell you is this is a good place to push through fear and risk. Um, what we discovered, specifically with the homeless community, there are so many other ways to serve. I, I just narrowed it on that, on this question. But um, what we discovered is um, ho homeless people are people. <laughs> They're yeah, like there it is. Um, sons and daughters and um, they're, they have dreams, and they've had jobs, and they've got families, and, um, and so life is just so hard. And so um, we have always been taken, uh, the, the, our homeless community in Austin has taken great care with our children, um, incredibly respectful and loving toward them and toward us as families. And so um, we've just brought our kids everywhere. So wherever we go, they go. Um, and they've been exposed to every sort of thing. I mean, you just cannot even... Imagine it. Um, and so you'd be really surprised what kids can handle. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but how amazing they are. Kids bring a gift mm -hmm. to that sort of missional environment they are. Um, kids do what they do. They bring joy. They bring happiness. They bring laughter. They're a great buffer. I just, yeah, it opens up the conversation. It absolutely does. Yeah. You know what? One time, I'll never forget this. Um, I think I wrote this and interrupted or something. I don't know. Some book. Um, we were downtown one time working with the homeless community. And... Of course, we all had our kids. I mean, there were kids literally everywhere. Our kids, by the way, bring 
footballs, <laughs> soccer balls. They play with everybody, and it's actually great fun. But um, uh, one of the men who were who was homeless pulled me aside, and he said, "You know what?" He said, "We've lost a lot of things. Um, the homeless community. We've lost um, a lot of us have lost our families. Um, we've lost our homes. Um, we've mostly lost our jobs. Um, we've lost our dignity." Um, but he said, "One thing that we've lost that nobody acknowledges is most of us have lost our children." And he said, "It's such a grief." And he said, "You and your church." Every time you come down here, you always bring your kids, all your kids. And he said, it just brings us such joy because most of us are parents um, and getting to be around the laughter of children. So I tell my kids all the time, listen, guys, just your presence is your gift. Yeah. Just you being here with your sweet, funny faces, with your goofy football, yeah. um, with your weird laugh, you are a gift to people. And so um, I think in general, I would just say, don't underestimate what your kids can handle. Um, you know, we're not necessarily wanting to raise our kids in such a protective bubble. Um, they really do need to be exposed to the world, and you're there to handle it and protect them and answer all the questions afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. And it might be harder, but it's worth it. Yep. Okay, next question from someone on poverty tourism. This is from Claire in Dayton, Ohio. Thank you, Claire. She said this, sadly, I've been on those mission trips, and we all thought we were doing good and storing up our treasures in heaven. I realize the flaws of our trip now. What are some other ways we can break this trend for current youth groups and future missions, and where can we start looking for help, like really help? Oh, goodness. I appreciate that question so very much. Um, thank you for asking it. Thank you for caring. I want to tell you, too, I've also been on that mission trip. Me, too. I've led that mission trip. Yeah. And so I have a lot of grace in this, in this conversation. I'm just glad we're having it. I feel like the church is doing a really good job right now of um, – presenting a humble posture here and, and coming to the table of community development as learners again. And I think that's the key. So I think the first thing is go humble, go silent, and be a listener. Um, and so let's listen to people who are doing this really, really well already. An incredible resource. I'm sure you've read this. Oh, I know you have another one. Say it in a minute. Um, an incredible resource that is great for you and your team. Like when you have a team, you say, this is mandatory reading. We're not even going to speak about the trip until we have worked chapter by chapter through this book um, and really unpack the lessons here is um, When Helping Hurts. Have yep. you read that? Yes. It's phenomenal. I mean, yep. When Helping Hurts was one of the first dominoes that started to fall mm -hmm. for me on this conversation. Um, because for me, Everything was so well intentioned. Mm -hmm. Same as everyone. Everything is. Yeah. Everyone no means one. well. Exactly. Yes. Nobody thinks. Let's go in and do damage uh -huh. to a poor right. community. Uh -huh. um, everyone means well. Um, but I, it was a blind spot to me. I did not even realize the places in which we were creating um, dependency mm -hmm. and actually humiliation. Um, that we were bringing kind of a sense of shame into a community um, with pity. Um, and so that is a fabulous reason. You know what I was just thinking? That book that you love. Just Mercy? Just Mercy. Just Mercy. Everyone has to read that book mm -hmm. this year. Best book I've read. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's, a, it's about a lot of our systems here in America, but it just opens your eyes up to things. That's just it. I feel like education is the key. Mm -hmm. To me, um, international, well, and even domestic for that matter, but community development in a vul with vulnerable people begins with education. And the thing is, is, once you sort of, once your eyes pop mm -hmm. open to this, you can't unsee it. Right. Then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, right. how did I never, how did I never mm -hmm. see that for what it was? Mm -hmm. And so, um, I know that that chapter was very direct, um, but I would say it always begins in the field. You do not ever, we do not ever, um, as servants, come to the table with the answers and the agenda. We come as servants with listening ears listening to the people on the ground first and foremost. I think that's a no, the number one thing, yep. is what are the people on the ground saying? Yep. So you don't come in and paint a building that just got painted last week from another mission trip. That's exactly right. And there are people there that can paint buildings and get a living. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Great stuff. Okay, so next question is from Leslie in Montgomery, Alabama. It's also under the poverty tourism, and then we'll move on to the yep. next chapter. This just says this. I work with a local ministry that serves a low-income, high-violence neighborhood. Folks often want to come in and help us, sometimes to take pictures with the kids, like they want to come Christmas caroling with the kids and stuff like that. How can we kindly refuse requests that are not aligned with our mission and vision without deterring people who truly do have a heart to serve? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leslie, mm -hmm. for that. Um, I wanted to answer that question specifically because 
there is there is a responsibility that lies with all of you watching who um, lead organizations, who you are already in and working in a vulnerable community. You're the leader. You're the nonprofit leader. You are um, the missions leader. So I know this decades of working with um, leaders on the ground, both domestically and internationally. But there is this sense of um, obligation they feel to Christians in America who want to come, like, I mean, they really want to come. They give us um, money. They give us money. Mm -hmm. This is part of our funding. Mm -hmm. We want them to go back and talk well about us, even though literally virtually every step of the trip is a burden. Mm -hmm. It's not actually helpful. Um, they actually cannot wait for us to leave. Um, it is exhausting, and it doesn't really even serve their purpose in the way we think it does is where they're feeling good. And so um, leaders, nonprofit leaders and activists, it is upon you, and we want you to sit in front of us kindly but firmly and say, I don't need you to come. Or if you're going to come, this is exactly how it needs to go. No more than this many people. This is what I actually need. And and be prepared. It might not be sexy work. Yeah. Like we want to do the fun stuff, the cute mm -hmm. stuff that looks great in the picture. pictures of it. Yeah. Um, it may be, and they may. You may need to say to the team who wants to come visit you, you can best serve me right where you're at, and here's how. Um, and so what I would love to see is this sort of firm assertion from our partners in the field and on the ground um, to really say, as much as I appreciate your um, intention mm -hmm. um, and your desire to serve me, I need to tell you that this, this, and this is not helpful and this, this, and this is. And so please, please, please do that. I'm telling you that we are developing ears to hear you and I hope that this conversation continually moves us toward humility mm -hmm. um, as we defer to you. Yeah. And I think it's good. This book is about like grace. And so they're going to be gracious when they tell you that. And then we're going to be gracious when we hear that. When someone says, hey, actually coming caroling at our place is not the best way. Right. And instead of us saying, well, I think that's an amazing thing. Totally. It's Christmas. Jesus' birth. That's right. How could you not want carols? Do you hate Jesus? Right. <laughs> yeah. Then to be able to say, okay, I accept that because yes. you run this show. So, Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good thing to do. Yeah, love it. Okay, let's go on to Dear Church. Mm -hmm. It's a good one right here. Okay, this is from Jenny in Colorado, and it says, Is it okay to just attend a church on Sunday without getting deeply involved? I already have sweet friends that I do life with. We pray, laugh, cry, study the Bible, and point each other to Jesus. Jenny. <laughs> Tricky. We're both pastor's wives <laughs> um, and have served in full-time church work, what, all of our adult life? All of it. Yeah. And so you might be surprised what I'm going to say. Um, I, in my understanding of the gospel and of the kingdom and how community really works in Christ, I think the umbrella over church is very large. Um, sometimes um, people are going to thrive in what looks like a traditional church environment. So it's going to it's going to have a pastor at the front behind a pulpit and you're going to have some music and it's going to be exactly what you think. Um, some people are absolutely going to thrive in home church. Some people are going to thrive in satellite. Um, some are going to thrive in a tiny little um, community church um, that it meets in a living room. And to me, um, when Jesus set the, set the church in front of us, um, it had very little to do with structure and a building, or none. Mm -hmm. It had none to do with that. Um, it had to do with the way we served one another, um, the way that we loved our neighbors, um, the way that we took care of each other's needs, the way that we honored and learned about God. And so to me, that is a very loose format. And I think it's going to look brilliant and beautiful in a thousand ways. If, if we were prepared to say that the only thing that counted in church was sort of the traditional American model, then we're also going to have to be prepared to discredit the entire underground church in China we are going to have to be prepared to discredit um, the persecuted church in the Middle East because um, zero of those look like our churches. And yet God is reigning and he is moving and his presence is being felt. And so for me, um, the building and the structure and the pastor and all, that is, that's the lowest part of what matters in a church. What matters to me is, um, is God being worshipped and honored and are we making disciples? 
and are we loving our neighbors? Yeah, and that community. And I was thinking the same thing. We have friends over the world that don't get to go to church like we do. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. And so um, I feel like if you are in a non-traditional structure, but you are growing, um, you are growing closer to Christ. You are growing as a disciple. You are. Your heart is being rendered, and you are able to love God and neighbor better. Then stay the course. Absolutely, stay the course. I I would love to see the church exercise a lot more grace. On, on structures. I hope that we never prioritize our methods over our message because we can sincerely rally around the same message in a thousand different ways. Good stuff. Okay, we got 10 minutes. We're going to move through these. Okay, okay the next one is um, from, this is from Allison in Illinois. Thank you, Allison, on Christians Stop Being So Crappy. Love that. She says this, Jesus was also was always gracious and loving, yet always truthful. In the church today, the temptation is to cling to truth and become judgmental mm -hmm. and condescending or lose the truth in the name of grace and love, mm -hmm. both sides. Mm -hmm. What are some practical ways you stay balanced in sticking to the essential truths of Jesus, yet being gracious and loving to those who differ in your beliefs? I love this question. It's incredibly relevant and incredibly nuanced. So I can simply tell you how I approach it, and then you can just take it or you can leave it. Um, this is a free webcast, so it doesn't cost you anything. You're not out any money. You can leave now yes. or you don't like it. Um, so two things that I think. Um, Jesus was so good at this. You, are, you, you nailed it. Nobody was better. I mean, John told us that he came to us full of truth and full of grace. 100%, 100%. It wasn't like 40, 60. Right. Math no. is hard. I'm <laughs> sorry. 40, math 60, are hard. Right? I'm, yeah. I'm words. You're yeah. numbers. Um, it was 100, 100. And so we have this incredible model to look toward. Um, as we balance grace and truth in a really complicated culture, um, what I would say about that is that Jesus is better at that than any of us are, um, because he was, you know, God. Yeah. And um, especially, he had a special capacity for mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Um, as a human being who is equally as sinful as the next person, mm -hmm. um, who is absolutely just a sinner saved by grace. End of story. That's just a fact. Yeah. I am always going to lead a little bit with grace to my fellow human being because I'm not Jesus. Now, I want you. To, I do not want you to hear me say, "Oh, truth, blah blah blah." Not at all. She didn't say it. Not at all. I just um, grace to me is the foot to lead with, and then truth can come behind it. Right. Um, a lot of people prioritize theology over posture, and how's that working out? Right? I mean, it's terrible. It's just people are lining the gutters um, because we've been so right at them with our truth for so long and left grace behind. But what I have found in my world and in my experience is that when, when grace is the first foot that we lead with, then truth very naturally is the second foot. And then we begin a walk. Right? Then we begin this, this walk down the path where these things are in balance for sure. And so I would say that there's this, um, this inclination among Christians to want to constantly put truth in front of someone else, right? Like, I want to show you your truth. Like, I want to expose um, what I think needs to be true in your life. So I wonder what would happen is if, as a community, we very much prioritize truth in my life, like in my family, in my community. When I said, I'm going to really focus on and making sure that my mind and my actions and my posture is so in line with truth at all times, and grace, then what would happen? Um, I don't find that most Christians are very much concerned about their own truth. They're concerned about somebody else's. Um, they're concerned that you don't have it right. Um, but how about we just like camp out in our own backyard for a while? Um, and so what I have found, because we live here in Austin, which is a really um, super secular city, um, and grace is a wonderful front door to truth. Wonderful front door. You've got to earn it. I mean, we have to earn the right to speak truthfully to one another and over one another. And so um, that is always the way I'm going to lead um, because I'm, I absolutely positively know that there is not one good thing about me except for Jesus. That's it. I mean, he is the only good thing in me. I am so close at all times to just being a moron. I am. And, and just to being terrible. And selfish and hateful and judgmental. I mean, that's always right under the surface for mm -hmm. me. And so um, I, I'm so self aware that I'm like, oh, Jesus, you know what I need? I need truth. Um, I need grace. 
Um, and so I'm still very much focused on that. Once I figure out all my truth, I'm very happy to sling it around everybody else. <laughs> um, but that to me in a culture that is already giving the church and Christians the complete side eye and with good cause, with good reason, because we have led with truth and left grace behind entirely. Um, I think this is a season in the church in which we say we are going to treat our communities with so much love and we will earn the right to be heard. Okay, love it. All right, we're going to breeze through these next ones. Beloved Sisters Bible Study. I love you guys. In Grand Rapids, yeah. um, they said this. I love Beloved Sisters That's Bible fresh. Study. I hope you have t-shirts. That's sweet. Um, how do you propose that women today stand up for our beliefs when often Christ followers are attacked constantly via news and social media outlets? How do we do this in a loving way without going crazy? You pretty much kind of talked on that real quick. Yeah. But bring the social media super, aspect Super, super, super quick. I would just say this. Um, uh, that was um, rhetoric that I grew up with. In my kind of church, standing up for our beliefs, um, I will not be ashamed. All that. Um, do you know? I've got to song. Of course. Yeah. I mean, mean I had the T-shirt, yeah, yeah. obviously. <laughs> um, I would say, rather than being so concerned about standing up for our beliefs right now. By the way, God does not need us to defend Him. He's been on His throne. Well, guys, I guess all this time, forever. <laughs> um, all this time, He's managed to stay sovereign and um, and mighty, and so. Honestly, he doesn't need our generation to defend him. He's fine. He's not going to fall out of heaven. Um, and so rather than standing up for our beliefs, I would love to see the church live out our beliefs. Now, there's something to talk about. Um, there's something that will turn heads. That, that's something that will draw an eye. Um, and so I'm not at all concerned with standing up for my beliefs. God is, God is doing just fine. Um, and so rather than convince people why I'm right and they're wrong, I think if we see a whole a whole community of believers decide, I'm going to live it out. I'm going to live out this love, this grace, this mercy, this compassion, this inclusion. Um, now that will absolutely change the kingdom. So true. There it is. That's it. Okay, this is a good question right here just for you. Hmm. I mean, they're all for you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, Julia in Scottsdale said this, I'm working on this whole headband thing. And I'm finding that I can't really rock it like you. Tips for it, and she had a hashtag. Hashtag hipster wannabe PW. Okay, this is really fun. Pastor, what's PW? Pastor's wife. Pastor's wife. Yeah, That's what we are. Right? Is yeah, that what that yeah, is? Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming. Okay. Okay, we need some hipster headband wear. This that was is, kind of a bad segue from the like, church. It's fine. Sorry. You know what? This also matters. You know what? We care about the church. We care about the world. But we also care about our hair. Yes. We care about fashion. Mm -hmm. It's stuff that matters. And I actually almost texted you the day after I saw you in a picture and said, where do I get that headband you had on? Let me tell you something right now, and I want you to listen to me. <laughs> you know, I would never lead you wrong. I will tell you right now. Here's the thing with the headband. Ditto the hat. Okay? Any hat. Any kind of hat. Uh-huh. Which this is awesome. Yeah. Headband and hat. Put it in the same category. If you if you just wear it out and you own it like a boss, no one questions you. I You're agree. like, oh, well, I guess she's the kind of person who can wear a headband. Yes. You don't ask somebody, can I wear this headband? You, you don't it. walk around and just say, I've never worn a headband and I'm a little bit weirded out. Nope. You just wear it um, like the boss that you are. Like the pastor's wife like the, that you are. <laughs> that's right. Like the hipster yeah. wannabe that you want to be. You are. And there you are. And so you might notice that in um, our little For the Love Book Club, I wore a hat twice uh -huh. and a headband once. Yeah. And the prop, the thing that you need to know about that is that equals dirty hair. Yeah. That's just a fact. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, you just own it. Yeah. Okay. You go buy you some, you wear them out, and there you are. Before you know it, you're going to be like, oh, I'm just a headband person. I, I wear headbands. That's it. It's like the earrings. People say, I could never wear them. Yes, you can. You put, put them in your ears. You put them in your ears. And you walk out the door. Yep, yep. That's how you wear big earrings. Oh, uh, okay. I have. We have one more question for you. Okay. But before we finish, we just want to say thank you. Oh my Me gosh. Too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you guys love this, Faith Gateway has another Bible study coming up. Not a Bible study. Book club. Book club. Book club. Online. In a couple weeks, online with Ann Spangler. She has a new study out, um, and it is called "Wicked Women of the Bible." That seems fun. That, that seems sounds fun. good. That it's, seems it, intriguing. The end of October. Just follow Faith Gateway. Okay. Last question. Terry in Georgetown, Indiana. I read the first part of your book so quickly because I loved it. When I got to the last chapter, I stalled. Aww. I put off reading the last chapter because I just didn't want the book to be over. I finally read the last chapter, and now I'm having gin withdrawals. That's sweet. That's what, cute. What's coming up with you next, Jen? Oh. That was that question. Okay. What's next for Jen Hatmaker? First of all, that is the nicest thing to say. And I do want to tell you, when I wrote that, that last chapter, I bawled like a baby. Aww. I felt the same way. I felt like, 
oh, we're done here with this book that I have just loved to write for you. And so I feel the same way, and I still can't read it. I still cry when I read it. Um, so um, this is a this is a two book deal, and so I am already writing the second one. And it's oh, you are. I am. I am. I have to turn it in March, y'all. That's where I'm at. Yeah. And so we it's super similar to for the love it's essay format it touches on like a bunch of stuff that we care about so some of it is like sobering and important and deep and some of it is absurd like we have to know thank you notes there's going to be thank you notes I, there can't not be at this <laughs> right, point. like right. that is just that is the it's going to be the common thread that ties the books together I love it. and so um excited to write the thank you notes excited i have so many ideas i mean my 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 list of essays are a mile long because they've just been pooling in my head. And so it's all in there. I am so excited to write it. And so um, it's coming next. And so, you know, stay tuned. Stay tuned. No title. It's no title. I have a little one. You can't say head, it. You can't say it. But I'd have to kill you if I told you. <laughs> and I love you. And so, um, but just be watching for it. It's, I'll be talking about it next year. Anyway, love you it. know what? Okay, where can people follow you? As if they don't already. But if they don't. If you don't. Um, there's my blog, jenhatmaker.com, which I've written on at least a couple of times <laughs> this summer. Say, yes. And Facebook, Twitter, yeah. Insta, all, all Jen, Jen Hatmaker. Hatmaker. Yep, it's just it. If you know my name, you can find me. Um, same for Jamie. Jamie Ivy everywhere. Yeah. Um, Insta, Twitter, Facebook. All of it. Website. Mm -hmm. um, and we have loved this with so you. Great. Loved it, loved it, loved it. I mean, so great that I'm sad. So great that I'm sad. Cheers um, to you. Cheers to you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, friends. Thank you, book we club. adore you. Adore you. We're just cheering you on in your groups and keep meeting. with your friends. Keep meeting. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And keep sending us your questions, and we'll keep answering them online. And your pictures. Yes. Okay. Love you. Bye, guys.